Good morning, everyone. I'm Mike Danaher. I'm an assistant attorney general with the New York State Attorney General's Office, appearing here for the first time under Attorney General Letitia James. Our new attorney general was uh, uh, sworn into office in January, and, or January 1st, and uh, we're going to continue our program here at Court Health Cooperative Extension, dealing with different consumer issues, consumer-related topics. Topic here today that we're talking about are, are con consumer credit issues. Um, credit is one of the um, important things that we have in our society. We're a very credit-based society. I did a little checking before I came out here today just to see kind of what is the, what is the overall scheme of credit. And I was able to, uh, to see that uh, overall household credit in the United States is somewhere in the neighborhood of 420 plus billion dollars. It's increased 5% just over, this is statistics from the end of 2018. Uh, this is an increase of 5% of just the year previous that the average household has ongoing credit card debt on the average of a, just under $7,000. That's just one aspect of consumer credit. Um, we have overall $9.4 trillion in mortgage debt, $1.27 trillion in auto debt, auto loan debt, and $1.4 trillion in student loan debt. That seems to have increased a lot over the, over the years, just in the increase in cost of uh, college education. The uh, overall, when you put all that type of debt together, uh, the statistics are that the average household has $135,768 in different types of debt. Mortgage, auto, um, student loans, credit card debt, all of that. And the total of everyone is over $13.5 trillion. So it plays a significant role in our day-to-day -day activities, and it's very important. Formally, you know, there's a whole host of reasons for this, but formally, uh, there were certain things out there that we buy now repeatedly that were considered to be convenience items. And those items are now, some would consider to be necessities. It used to be many, many, many years ago that automobile was a convenience item. Now for many people, especially those not in uh, large metropolitan areas, a automobile is more of a necessity to get to work, to get to the grocery store, those sorts of things. Uh, I hate to say this, but it seems like that we've moved into the fact that computers are almost a necessity. Well, and some people go, oh, that's hogwash. But think about it. A lot of education, our kids, our kids growing up, being able to do homework, being able to have access to, to educational materials and to do educational work, is, it's a necessity to have a computer. Computers are being um, furnished in schools nowadays. Um, credit does, in fact, give us some, conven some convenience, but um, it can also prove to be a safety measure. I don't know about you out there, but I carry very little cash with me compared to the transactions that I undertake. I can't remember the last time I actually paid cash for gas. I go to the, st the store, uh, the, the gas station, and I put my card in, and, uh, and the machine says, just start pumping whatever gas you want. And, and, I do it, and I do it that way. And that way I don't have to, especially, um, you know, when it's, when it's uh, you know, a, a 
gas bill is $25 or $30 to fill up the car and to, based on the fact that I don't carry a ton of cash around with me, I have to go in and hand $30 of probably the $40 that I actually have with me to pay. So I, I just pay with that. So it's, it is convenience. It's actually safe. It can be for safety. The less cash that you carry around with you, the less likely that you are going to be accosted and end up turning over your entire paycheck because you carry it around in cash with you. We may need it for emergency purposes. It might be an auto repair, a medical bill, uh, the expense of going to visit a sick relative. We may need to use some type of credit in order to do that. And then you, we put on top of that what we're here to talk about today are scams related to credit is that credit scams are very difficult to de detect. They're difficult to detect as they're initiated and as they're kind of going on, they're much more likely to detect after the whole thing has occurred and then it makes it more difficult to not be involved in it because you've already been involved in it and to uh, overturn it, overturn it later on. Uh, many times uh, a credit scam is not dis understood until everyone is long gone. Parties are all dispersed. May not find out about till weeks, months, and sometimes years later. You may not find out about it, especially worrisome, when you actually need the credit and there was a scam that was perpetrated that you didn't even know it was going and you go to try and get credit and you can't get it because that you've been victimized by a fraud and it takes a very long time to unravel a a scam so we have to be really really careful about the use of our scam um, the biggest area impacted by credit scams is identity theft one of the big things that scam artists do is steal our identity for the purpose of engaging in credit scams, making loan applications, credit card applications in our name, those sorts of things. Um, we often think of or take our credit for granted. You know, it's there. It's just there. We don't need it all the time, we don't use it all the time, we just know that when we need it, it's always going to be there. But that's not necessarily the case. Uh, we get credit applications all the time from people. We get inundated with emails about how you can fix your credit. I don't know about you, but I get, receive a lot of telephone calls, probably the majority of telephone calls to our house, on our house phone, yes, we still do have a house phone. Um, of somebody trying to uh, reduce the interest rate on your credit cards. Uh, usually it's an automated call asking for, for uh, if you need help in, in adjust, adjusting or modifying the interest on in your credit cards. So we don't really think twice about it. You know, it's always there. We whip out the credit card, we buy that thing, we're good to go. Uh, we get car loans, we need car repairs, we purchase new homes, we get student loans, we have all of this available to us, but when the problem occurs, we then have to try and go and figure out what happened, how do we unravel it, how can we get that credit, how can we straighten that out, how can we prove to somebody that that wasn't our loan that was taken out on our name. So how does this fraud occur in these sorts of situations? Well, I think we've become very comfortable in having less face-to-face -face contact with people. So it used to be you needed a loan, you went down to the bank, you usually knew the people in the bank, and they knew you. You would make a loan application through them, they would uh, uh, give you the loan, and everything would be fine. Now we're um, having much less face-to-face -face contact. People are applying for loans and getting loans online. They're getting credit card applications that they, that they respond to. There are people that have uh, created a, a whole industry uh, of, of personal finance related around use of credit cards. I was just reading an article the other day in the Wall Street Journal. And it had a, a 
an article and then interviews with people who um, have played one credit card against the other and they will apply for this credit card because when you sign up for this credit card you get a certain number of bonus miles airline travel and then uh, they'll stop using that card because then they'll open a new one with these other points and another one is offering 2% on all purchases another one's offering 5% on certain purchases and so they'll, they'll just keep playing it around till they build up all these points that in the article mentioned uh, uh, someone who had been traveling all over the world on their bonus miles that they would have accumulated and, and uh, people making purchases with money that they've accumulated and they're just, that's all they're doing. They're just doing the, using the whole system and the, and the main thrust of the article was that banks are starting to pull back on this because it's starting to cost them a fortune. And especially because on the other end, the retailers that will accept these cards are fighting back against the banks who are issuing the cards of the, um, the merchant fees that they're being charged. Because when you use your credit card, the merchant gets charged. Small per percentage, but it adds up over time. And some larger merchants, I'm sure some of you can think of who those are, have gone to the banks and said, we're not going to pay that much to you anymore. If you want us to continue using your, uh, accepting your particular cards, you got to give us a better deal on the rates. And so the banks are saying, well, you know, we can't cut off this big, these big, huge merchants. So we've got to do that deal. Well, on the other side, we can't be offering the bonus packages that we're offering to the consumers who get the cards as much because we can't make money can't make as much money. So that was the whole whole gist of the, the article. But you can see how important this area is. And in the identity theft realm, if, you, if somebody's playing with different credit and cards and responding to those sorts of things, they can get caught up with maybe applying for a card that really is just a scam. And we don't think twice about it because when we're talking about credit, what do we expect to have to do? What we expect to have to do to get credit is name, address, social security number, bank account information, employment information, income information, all this personal information we have to give up to, in some instances, people we don't know. We're online, we're filling out the credit card application. How do we know that it is a legitimate outfit? Um, we, uh, scam artists will then use this information to take out loans, get credit in your name. You may not even know that they're going for the credit. Um, they may have the bill sent to a different address. Nobody is calling you about it. And before you know it, know it that these people go out, they get credit in your name, they buy things, um, they don't pay the bill, and all of a sudden that's when you start hearing about it. We have to go a long way toward protecting ourselves related to credit. We need in the best, uh, the best information that I can give you, best advice I can give you, is that you should keep your private information private. Don't give out any personal information, name, address, social security number, your mother's maiden name, your first pet's name, your second cousin's middle name or anything like that to someone you don't know. Keep credit card and social security information to yourself. One affirmative thing that we can do as a good consumer is we are allowed to get a free copy of our credit report. There is um, um, a push now in some legislatures to try and make all credit reports free, even more than just the one a year that we get. Who knows what will happen with that. But um, be aware of what is on your credit report. Uh, for those of you that don't know, you can get a free copy of your credit report from the three major credit reporting agencies, one each. Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion, those are the three. They maintain a joint kind of website. It's known as www.annualcreditreport.com. 
That's one word, annual credit report. You can go on that site and you can actually order a free copy of your credit report each year. Do it. Go through it. Make sure that everything on there is accurate. If it is not accurate, even if there's something listed on your credit report that says that you have an open credit card, has a zero balance or that the, that the payments on that credit card are current, even if it says that, if that credit card does not look like it's yours or anything that you have familiarity with, you need to contact that credit card company to find out more information about it <clears throat> so that, one, you may want to cancel it if you have no knowledge about it, or two, maybe it'll refresh your recollection that there's outsta this outstanding credit card that you stuck in a drawer somewhere um, that you never use. Well, if you never use it, you don't need it, you can cancel it. Um, I know there are some credit cards out there. I have one. Actually, I have two. With uh, uh, a credit card company that when you get your monthly statement, it actually gives you your credit score. Um, credit score is important because it does um, give an accumulated number that reflects your credit, um, your, cr your credit ability. The thing I say though is go more than just a credit score. The credit score is made up of a whole number of things. The typical credit score, the, one of the main credit scores that creditors look at, banks look at in offering loans, is a thing called the FICO score. It's a fair, it's, it's actually F-I-C-O, FICO score. It's actually a score that is developed by a company called Fair Isaac and Company. And, and what it does is it, it goes out in the cyber, or it goes out in the world and pulls in all the credit information about you. Then it has an algorithm that, that gives values to your credit, your income, bank, a, bank information, your, uh, your uh, fidelity to paying your payments on time, your payment history, that sort of thing, and it mashes it all up in this algorithm and spits out a number. And the number, the, the maximum number is 850. I'm not sure what the bottom line number is, but the, the, the top number is 850. And the higher your number, closer to 850, the more credit worthy you are. So yeah, that number is important because it's a company that's taken a mishmash of every, all of your credit and income and everything out there and, and said, OK, this is a number. And the, the credit offerer will look at it and say, wow, that's a really good number. This person's really credit worthy. We're going to give them the auto loan because their number is so good. But that number is really a function of the underlying data. The underlying, do you have credit cards? How much do you have in credit cards? Do you pay them on time? Do you only pay the minimum balance? Do you pay them off every month? Do you pay your car payment when you're supposed to pay it. Uh, how much credit have you had? Do you have no credit, which is a lower FICO score, or do you have a, a fair number of credit cards that you've paid religiously every single month? Then your, your FICO score goes up. The thing that I would focus on out there is get a free copy of your credit report. Get it from each of the three credit reporting agencies. If everything is accurate that's on that credit report, all the debts, all the payment history, all that stuff, then the FICO score number that all this data is accumulated to make is going gonna, is gonna to be good. And it's going to accurately reflect what the underlying debt is. If, however, you have a low FICO score and you think your, your credit score should be higher, the, the, First thing that you would look at is not to challenge the number, but to challenge the data that would ultimately make up that number. Like there might be something on your credit report that shows that you're late in, in uh, paying a bill or paying debts. It may show that you have too much debt that you're really, you're really strapped. Um, 
It could be a whole host of things. That's the stuff that you have to attack. That's the stuff that you have to be aware of. So get a free copy of your credit report. Make sure everything is on there is true. If it's not true, go to the creditor and challenge those items that, that, that make up your ultimate credit score. Um, most uh, common nod fraud issues occur when consumers don't realize some, some things. We talked about at the outset that credit is, is what makes our society run lots of times. I mean, look at it. You hear reports, uh, they call it macroeconomic, but you look at the overall um, interest rates that are out there and whether they're going up and going down. And, and I know that uh, frequently you'll see people on social media or in the news uh, talking about the Federal Reserve and they've increased in interest, the interest rate and all of a sudden the, the interest rate goes up and economy slows down or the interest rate goes down and inflation picks up. There are a whole host of things all revolved around credit. And what people, us, you and me, individuals have to understand that um, issues related with pers a person's credit, whether someone has poor credit or not, is many times a result of us not paying attention, us not being a good consumer, uh, good consumer related to their credit decisions. People have to understand what credit is. What, did, what, is, it, what is going on out there? People have to understand that um, credit is merely a loan. We don't think of it necessarily when we use our credit card that it's a loan, it's just this thing. We, it's a piece of plastic. People put, the, put it on a statement and we get the statement at the end of the month and we pay it. Well, in actuality, it's a loan. It's, a revol it's called a revolving line of credit, which means that you know it, you, you credit, you pay some back, it keeps going and you add more credit and you, then you pay more and, you, and, and, and it all fleshes out in the end. So it's always revolving, but it still is credit and it is still is a loan. In essence, a bank has made a loan to pay off the merchant that you bought something from and you have to pay the bank back. Or you go to the, you go get a car, you understand it's a loan, you go to get the car and, and I know a lot of people don't understand the terms of credit and therefore can get themselves into a bind. And let's use the example of a car loan. I know there are a lot of consumers out there that only focus on the monthly payment that they can afford. That's all they're concerned about, monthly payment. If I can pay, if I can get a car loan for $250 a month or less, I'm good. And they don't focus on anything else. All they focus is on the monthly payment. And that is a huge financial uh, mistake because let's talk about what's the anatomy of, a, of credit and anatomy of a loan. Credit is a loan. Somebody makes a loan to you. Well, how much is the loan? The loan is, the principal amount of the loan is what you're borrowing. It might be $10,000 to buy a car. You're borrowing $10,000. And what makes up paying it back? Well, it's not just the monthly payment. What you have to take into account is in paying something back and figuring out that monthly payment is made up of three things. One is the principal amount, the amount that you are borrowing, the total amount, $10,000. The interest rate you're being charged. Well, what is interest anyway? Interest on a credit card, interest on a bank loan. What is it really? What it is is the cost that you are being charged, the fee you are being charged for borrowing the $10,000. People aren't just going to give you $10,000 and say, hey, when you give me back $10,000, we're good. Because there's a value to the use of that money and there's a cost to the person who gives you, or entity that gives you that money, and that cost to them is what they could have used that money for for something else. So you have to pay them to allow a fee for using their money, and that's the interest rate. The next thing you have to take into account is how long do you have to pay back the loan? In other words, how long are you going to hold on to? this person's $10,000.
and you have to pay the loan back at an interest rate over a period of time. You have to take into account in deciding on credit those three items because I will give you an example. The longer you have that money, the more in total dollars it's going to cost you. If you borrow $10,000, somebody gives you $10,000, and you pay them back in three years, in actual dollars, you're going to pay them significantly less money over those three years than if you paid back that exact same $10,000 over five years. Because you have their money longer. The longer you have the money, the longer you have to pay them back. And it, it can be significant. What we as good consumers have to look at is how much in total dollars over the length of a loan do we have to pay back? Do we pay back, to pay back that $10,000, it could cost you $20,000. You go, oh my gosh, it's twice as much money that I borrowed. But if you stretch that loan out long enough, that's what's going to happen. So the idea is you want the lowest interest rate for the shortest period of time. What you have to do as a good consumer is pay back that money as fast as you can um, and get the lowest interest rate that you can. And I'm seeing now, let's use the auto loan. Auto loans used to always be, back in the day, I always refer to back in the day, you used to be able to get like a three-year loan on the car. It, you know, one of the fundamental reasons was cars broke down more, and so the banks wanted to get their money back before the car was of no value. Um, and then that stretched out. You get a four-year car loan, and that kind of stretched out. So you get five-year car loan. I have heard of the possibility that auto loans now are stretched out somewhere in the neighborhood of could be stretched out to eight years. And if that's the case, and the consumers only think about the monthly payment, they can think, wow, I can afford this particular car because they took my $10,000 and stretched the monthly payments over eight years. The thing that you don't think about is, if I stretch this loan out at 5% for eight years, in total amount of money that we're paying, it's significant compared to what you would have paid if it was only a five-year loan or a three-year loan. And then what, what ends up happening is, is you take your hard-earned money, and again, I'm just using it, uh, pulling numbers out of the air. It's not any calculation that I've done. But a, a, a loan stretched out over eight years, let's say a $10,000 loan stretched over eight years, might cost you $18,000 when you get done at the end of the, of the ten year, eight years. Whereas it might have cost you $13,000 if you paid it off in five years or three years. And you know what the impact is? It's maybe, again, a number grabbed out of the air. It might be an extra $30 a month in your payment. That's all. To save thousands of dollars. So don't just go into any loan situation. In this case, we've been using an auto loan. Don't just go in thinking, OK, I'm going to go in and buy in a car, and I'm going to find a car that is only going to cost me $250 a month. Because you may end up getting that car at $250 a month, but at a 9% interest rate paid over eight years. Whereas you might have been able to get a car by thinking, OK, I'm going in, and I think I'm going to be able to afford a car that's $15,000. Because I can put down five of my own, and I'll have to borrow 10. And then, if you're a good consumer, before you go in to do that, you actually go online and you figure out if you borrowed $10,000, how much is the monthly payment going to be roughly? So you have an idea. So that when you go in, you're a fully informed consumer, something that we advocate strenuously here at our consumer issue sessions at Cornell Cooperative Extension. Be a good consumer. You know going into the deal how much you can afford 
because you know generally how much of a loan you're going to have to have and how much that loan is going to uh, cost you. If you do that, you will go a long way toward having a very comfortable decision to be made on what you can purchase. The worst thing you do is go in and say, you know, uh, I can afford $250 a month. And then uh, the salesman's eyes lights up as he takes you out into the yard to say, okay, well, at $250 a month, you could drive this car, this car, this car, this car. But you never determined how much it was going to be that you had to pay over the entire life of this loan and um, end up getting something that you may not necessarily want. So understand credit. Be a good consumer in using the credit, and you will be... Um, you will, you will benefit tremendously. Let's kind of fast forward over to the issue of what happens when I have some credit problems or there's some issues related to my credit. Well, there, there are certain laws on the books that are out there to help protect consumers. One is the Fair Credit Reporting Act. It's a federal law. It's very detailed, can be very complicated, but it was enacted as a safeguard to keep people's credit information private. It, the, under the Fair Credit Reporting Act, not everybody can just go and get a copy of your credit. It's private. It's something that you can have and that, that, that you control and that you can only authorize people to go out. Credit under the Fair Credit Reporting Act can only be given out to certain designated parties. One is someone who has received your written permission. Another one who's someone who is extending credit to you. And that is credit that you have asked for. I know that we frequently receive these mailers that say, hey, get this great credit card with all these bonus points and low interest rates and 0% financing for the first six months and all that sort of thing. And you wonder, well, how did I get that thing in the mail anyway? How did they know that I would qualify for the loan? Well, they don't know. What happens in that circumstance is the credit offerer, the one that issues the credit to you, will go to the credit reporting agencies and not ask for your particular credit. What they'll do is they'll ask for uh, information, ask it for people who would fall within these parameters, like people who uh, may have a credit score of a certain amount um, or something. They send you the offer, say, wow, this great credit offer of 0% and for six months, whatever. That's just because you fell within a general category. Doesn't mean. Because if you look at those, and I challenge you to do this, if you get something like in the mail, and I know we, we immediately throw it in the bin, which don't do that, shred it, don't have it out there so that someone can get their hands on it. Um, look at the small print. There's usually asterisk, and the asterisk usually goes to a part that says that it, this offer, um, it, you need to confirm that the information is accurate. In other words, you're going to have to give them information so that they have access to you, your actual credit and your actual personal information that's on the credit. It's just a general advertising offer that they've sent to you because you, f you may have fallen in with thousands of other people in a general category. But then once you contact them to get the zero inches credit card, they're going to do a more in-depth credit check on you to make sure that you are credit worthy for having it offered. So written permission, someone who is extending credit to you based on your, your permission. So you go to the bank, you want to make a loan, they can do a credit check on you. You want a credit card, you make an application for a credit card, they'll do a credit check on you. That's, that's why you always have to give up your personal information when you apply for credit because they have to do a credit check. Someone who is a debt collector, someone who you have an outstanding debt with can do your credit check. Someone who you apply to for employment can also do a credit check. Um, they have to have a legitimate reason under the Fair Credit Reporting Act, they have to have a legitimate reason in order to get your credit information. If you apply for credit, you get an adverse determination, meaning you're not getting the credit. 
you have the right under the Fair Credit Reporting Act to get a copy of your credit report within 60 days of being denied credit. You are entitled to get one so that you can see why, I, what from your credit report may have triggered you not getting this credit. And frequently, that's the trigger that people find out that they might have been a victim of identity theft. They get turned down by credit, they ask for a copy of their credit report, and they see on the credit report there's this, all this credit that they never knew that they applied for. We can avoid that whole situation by getting a, be proactive, get a copy of your credit report ahead of time. Um, you have the right to challenge any inaccurate information that's on your credit report. You do that by notifying the, the credit reporting agencies. You, if you've been a victim of identity theft, if you notify one credit reporting agency, they are obligated to notify the other two. You should also notify the creditor itself. So if it shows on your credit report that there's this outstanding loan with a bank, you should notify not only the credit reporting agency, but also the creditor, the bank listed there. The credit reporting agency, Equifax, Experian, uh, and TransUnion, they have the obligation, if you challenge information, uh, they have the obligation to go and reinvestigate that information and if they cannot verify the accuracy of that information on the credit report, they must remove it. So that's the Fair Credit Reporting Act. We also have a Fair Debt Collection Act, another f uh, statute that's out there, that is to protect those of us who are contacted by someone who's a temp third party uh, debt collector who's out there trying to collect. Uh, so suppose you have a problem paying uh, somebody bank, uh, somebody back. First and foremost, you, we all know you have the obligation, but there are some situations where people can't do it for whatever reason. Maybe they had a health issue, couldn't work for a while, had some problems with credit, uh, with paying back their debts. So under the Fair Debt Collection Act, yes, you're you're obligated to pay back your legitimate debts, but you have the right not to be subject to abuse or harassment related to that debt. There are certain things. Creditor, the debt collectors are, cannot contact you um, outside the hours of 8 a.m. to 9 p.m. So 10 o'clock at night, they cannot, it's a violation of the Fair Debt Collection Act to be contacting you trying to collect your, to collect the debt or before 8 a.m. They cannot contact you at work if they know that it bothers your employer. So they can't do repeatedly call them. If you do receive telephone calls from uh, uh, a debt collector, uh, immediately tell them and keep a note that you told them that it is not appropriate for them to be contacting you at work and that they should stop immediately. Frankly, what I would also tell you to do is if you have an address for that debt collector to write to them and keep a copy of what you of the letter that you sent saying that you are not to be contacted at, uh, at your employment, not called at your employment. Um, they can only contact neighbors or someone else uh, to, to, to locate you. They can't tell them the reason for the debt collect. They, they, can't reason, they can't tell you for the reason for their call, and they can only call to uh, find out if uh, to locate you. So what you could do is if you are having a credit problem, to avoid them trying to contact others, you uh, can notify the person that you, the entity that you owe the money, that you are struggling with making this payment. You understand and recognize that you owe the debt, but do not contact you any further. If the uh, creditor is notified that they are not to contact you, and the debt collector is notified they are not to contact you, um, if you notify them in writing that they must cease all contact except for uh, legitimate legal rights that they have to do that, which is if they wanted to sue you, which they'd have the right to do, they could go ahead and still sue you, but they can't ha uh, um, harass you uh, and, and repeatedly call you. Uh, that's a violation of the law, and there are significant penalties for those that are violating those. There are pr other prohibited practices. They can't threaten you with violence. They can't um, make uh, uh, threats of something they are not going to do. If they are not, if they're, if they are not going to sue you, they cannot threaten to sue you. Uh, if they, if they are 
uh, threatening to take some other type of action that they do not intend to undertake, that is a violation. They can't imply that they're attorneys or other government officials. They cannot threaten you with arrest. You cannot be arrested for owing money. You cannot. So they can't threaten that they're going to have somebody down to arrest you. That's a frequent scam. People will call and say, you owe this debt and we're going to have you arrested. My response to them is bring it on. I look forward to the police coming to my house. They can't do that. It's against the law. They can't threaten to do it. And because legitimate debt collectors um, know that's the rule, in a lot of instances, the threats that we receive from someone who calls us threatening you're going to be arrested are oftentimes a scam. Do not respond to them. Hang up the phone. Um, they can't send you papers that look like legal forms. They can send you legal forms. Uh, they, can, they can sue you if you legitimately owe debt. Um, but they can't send you forms that look like legal papers when they are not and there's no intention of doing so. What you should do is report any abuses to my office, the Attorney General's office. Um, another thing that I want to point out is that there are some companies out there that uh, are well, what are referred to in the uh, in the trade as debt settlement companies? Oh, if you owe more than ten thousand dollars in debt, come to us, and we can we can reduce the amount that they're claiming that is owed, and uh, we can make everything all better for you. Be very careful about those organizations. There are legitimate local credit counseling operations uh, in your communities. You should. Seek those out first before you do anything with these, following up with these ads or emails re, that you receive that uh, purportedly will help you get out of debt. Um, there are many scams associated with that. I know that Cornell Cooperative Extension here has uh, assistance for financials, uh, household finances, and financial planning. And that's, uh, you know, financial planning as, as in debt planning and household bills and things. I encourage you, contact Cornell Cooperative Extension. They put on great programs that can help you and uh, before you sign up for these other places. The kind of scams that we've received from debt settlement companies is they say, well, for a low monthly payment, I can help satisfy all of your debts. And what they will sometimes tell you to do is stop paying your creditor. Stop paying the person you owe the money. Pay us instead. We'll negotiate with them, and we'll get your debt down. Well, what they do lots of times, and this is illegal, is they take your money and they first apply it toward the fees that you owe them. And what they do is charge you based on how much money they quote unquote saved you. You owe fifteen thousand dollars, and they get all your their attempt to get all your debts paid for seventy five hundred. Then you owe them. Uh, money based on the the amount that you've uh, saved them, and what they'll do is they'll figure, okay, well, they owe fifteen thousand. We're gonna get them out for seventy five hundred, possibly. So the fee is gonna be a certain percentage of that seventy five hundred that they're saving you. And what they do is whatever that fee is, they take it up front. So if they say, okay, you pay us two hundred and twenty dollars a month, and we'll settle your debts. Well, if the fees that you pay them are $3,500, that $220 a month you're paying them, they're going to apply just toward the $3,500 that you owe them. And get the scenario. You're paying them. They're keeping it for themselves. What's that mean? The creditor's not getting paid. You've been told don't pay them, and they're not paying them. So you're getting a really mad creditor who's not getting any money. And then they'll tell you, oh, oh, oh don't uh, disregard their calls. We'll take care of it for you. Understand that when you're dealing with a debt settlement company, the only agreement you have is between you and the debt settlement company. Your creditor has not signed on to this deal whatsoever. The creditor is not bound by anything that you have agreed to with the debt settlement company. So they still have the right to sue you, to call you to collect the debt. They have the rights to do that because they're not part of your 
of your agreement. And what ends up happening is they end up suing the, the consumer and the consumer goes back to the debt settlement company and says, hey, hey, I'm, I'm getting sued by this person. You're supposed to pay him off. And the debt settlement company goes, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll get around to it. We'll, we'll, we'll work on it. And what, what they attempt to do is, with your monthly payment, they attempt to accumulate a pool of money. And what they'll do is they'll go back and they'll say, and we'll make it simple. Rather than have multiple, multiple credit card debt that you owe that add up to the $15,000, let us just say you have one credit card bill that adds up to the $15,000. What they hope to do is, once they've accumulated a pool of money, let's say $7,500, they go back to the creditor and they say, hey, guess what? I got some, I have some money for you. I have a pool of $7,500. That we can use and we'll pay, you take that money, pays off the debt entirely, and we're good. And the consumer's happy. Now, that could work. They could pay them. After having accumulated $220 a month, for how long to build up that pool? They may have $3,500 built up. They'll go to one of your creditors, in this case, or say there is only one, and they'll say, hey, I have $3,500. Take the $3,500, lump sum payment, we'll pay you like that for this ent entire debt. Some creditors will say, okay. Some creditors will say, no way. We're gonna continue to try and force our rights. The thing to point out is the creditor is not bound by any of this. You could still get sued. You could still have your, and will, have your credit ruined because of it. Um, that's why you need to go to a consumer credit counseling entity, Cornell Cooperative Extension or others, not-for-profit, community-based kind of organizations. Don't be dealing with a company in California or a company in Texas or worse, a company you don't know where they are. Deal with somebody local. There are a lot of local resources that you can check into. Please, please, please do that. And then you can have, for lack of a better term, a no bull conversation. You can sit down with somebody. You can sit, a legitimate help helper with finances and debts and things like a Cornell Crawford extension. They're not going to say, yeah, there's a way that you can pay $50 a month and get out of your $15,000 debt. They're not going to pull a rabbit out of the hat. They're going to have a frank discussion with you to give you some guidance as to what you can do to try to help yourself. That's the advice that you need as a good consumer. Not somebody making promises that can't be kept up. Get the advice. Uh, be, uh, be a good consumer. Um, these entities that you see, these debt settlement companies that you see on TV advertising or you see on the internet or you receive in an email can be very, very expensive and not in your best interest. We always advocate be a good consumer. If you take these... Uh, items into account, um, you will go a long way toward helping yourself and potentially pulling yourself out of a, a very deep hole. Um, it's not going to go away. If you have a credit issue, it's not going to go away. You need to get out ahead of it to try to do what you can to try to resolve it in the best way possible. There are ultimate ways to, to try to resolve people who have accumulated um, unintentionally with the best, um, the best interest in mind, but they just got into a hole. There are ways to get out of it. There are, you know, possibly bankruptcy ways that you can get out of it. Um, but pursue all your avenues. You go a long way toward protecting it. We, we, we are a credit-based society, as we discussed initially. We're a credit-based society, and, uh, and we need to be good consumers in how we handle our credit and how we use our credit. If you do that, uh, I think that you'll, you'll, you'll be, a one, a good consumer, uh, and two, you'll live uh, a um, less stress-free life 
and you'll be able to participate in society. Um, so I encourage you all, um, stay on top of your credit, um, be vigilant about it, and, uh, and that way you'll be a good consumer. If anybody has any questions, I'd be glad to answer those. If not, please, we want you all to come and join us again. Uh, those of you out in TV land, come and join us here at Cornell Cooperative Extension. We are here on the second Tuesday of every month. Uh, second Thursday, I misspoke. Second Thursday of every month, 615 Willow Avenue, right here in Binghamton, or I'm, I'm from Binghamton, in Ithaca. Um, we encourage people to come. There are people, when they're in the uh, crowd, that they'll sometimes ask questions about something that I never even thought about, so it's really uh, good to have you here. You add to our discussion. Uh, we also have a program at the end of uh, at the end of our taping. I'm actually here for a while, so if somebody has a consumer-related topic that they would like to come in and speak with me about, come on down. Come down and join us. I'm here from 11 to 1, roughly, uh, second Thursday of the month at Cornell Cooperative Extension. So I hope that at some point in the future, we will see all of you. So thank you very much, and, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.